Um, first of all, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Lorraine Collins. I am a professor in community health and health behavior and Gloria's mentor for her dissertation. Um, by way of introduction, I'll give you some background uh, about Gloria and her academic career. She began with a bachelor's degree in communication studies at the African University College of Communication in Accra, Ghana. In 2015, Gloria moved to the US to the Ohio um, State University in Athens, Ohio, where she earned two master's degrees, an MA in international studies and an MPH in the Department of Social and Public Health. In 2018, she uh, started in Community Health and Health Behavior Doctoral Program. And it's been my pleasure to serve as Gloria's mentor in that program during the past year. Some highlights of Gloria's activities and accomplishments at the University at Buffalo are as follows. She received an author, Arthur Schomburg Fellowship she was a trainee in an NIH funded initiative for maximizing student development. And she was NSF funded as part of the Navigate um, program where she was a fellow. One of the things I have to say is even before I became her mentor, I would see Gloria in so many activities and so many programs. I was very impressed by that. She showed a lot of initiative. Um, during her years at UB, she was a research assistant on multiple projects, a teaching assistant and a student mentor. Um, she was active in student and professional organizations and served on numerous UB committees. And because I wanna make sure that Gloria has time to present, I will not list them all, but she definitely has um, engaged with a range of activities. Dissemination activities are very important for a PhD student. And Gloria has definitely um, disseminated research uh, related to her interests in global HIV AIDS prevention um, and immigrant and refugee health. Those are, I think, the two areas that are most relevant to her dissertation research. She's the author on eight peer-reviewed journal articles, first author on three of those publications, and we know that there's more to come. She's presented 23 posters and oral presentations at scientific meetings, such as the Society for Behavioral Medicine, and of course, the American Public Health Association. Most recently, literally last week, she was selected as the winner of the Lancet Student Global Health Poster Competition. So we're very proud of Gloria's accomplishments um, related to her presentations. She's given multiple invited talks, um, two that are worthy of mention. She gave a talk at the University of Washington's Department of Medicine, and she's given talks at the Yale University Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS. Today's presentation of Gloria's dissertation is entitled, Exploring the Acceptability and Potential Use of Pre-Exposure Prophylaxis, or PrEP, for HIV prevention among Ghanaian immigrants in the United States of America. I'll turn it over to Gloria and thanks again for coming. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Thank you for that introduction. I, <laughs> I would now share my screen and then we would begin. I would need to hide all your faces. And so I wouldn't be able to see your face whilst we do this. And I hope everyone can hear me. So welcome everyone and thank you so much for being here. Um, my talk today is focused on the acceptability and potential of oral HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis among Ghanaian immigrants. 
So I will really be discussing um, the summary of the HIV epidemic in the US, HIV among black people in America, African immigrants in the US, HIV among African immigrants, pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, some HIV prevention strategies, my guiding frameworks and theories, and my study aims. Then I will summarize my three manuscripts as well as um, talk about the general picture in the form of my um, general conclusions. So let's get to it. At the end of 2019, there was an estimated 34,800 newly infected HIV cases. And currently there are 1.2 million people living in the US with HIV. Out of those 1.2 million, we have 13% that do not know they have HIV. So approximately 156,000 people. And so we have people who are living with HIV, but they do not know they have it and may be potentially spreading it. A breakdown of the new HIV cases by race and ethnicity provides further context on who experiences a disparate burden of HIV in the US. So from this chart, we can observe that African-Americans continue to experience the greatest burden of HIV compared to other race and ethnicities in the United States. In 2019, Black Americans accounted for 13% of the US population, yet they accounted for 43% of all new HIV diagnoses. But we do know that there's heterogeneity among Black people. So the Office of Management and Budget has five broad categories for reporting race and ethnicity. And these are Black or African American, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander and whites. Um, the Office of Management and Budget sometimes also permits uh, the Census Bureau to use a set category called some other race. Now under the Black African American category, we have three really broad groups that are collapsed together. So we have African Americans, we have Sub-Saharan Africans, and then we have Caribbeans that are all collapsed in this group. In the picture on the right, Interestingly, when people write any of the indicated nationalities you see in this picture, the OMB still requires that they are collapsed into the broad black category. And as you can see from the picture, many Dominicans don't even consider themselves black, but by categorization, they are placed in this box. So regarding the incidents I mentioned earlier, that 43% among um, African-American, Black African-Americans, it is most likely that this number, um, the numbers from Africans or even Caribbeans could be influencing this high number. But we really wouldn't know until we disaggregate the data and also if we begin to look at these groups individually. And so my focus is really on African immigrants, specifically Ghanaian immigrants. And in subsequent slides, I will discuss African immigrants and HIV in the US. African immigrants is really an umbrella term that includes immigrant and refugee as well. So usually reporting agencies do not make the distinctions unless it is for refugee specific uh, services. So briefly, an immigrant is someone who has chosen to move to a place while a refugee was forced to leave due to a variety of conditions or factors. African immigrants actually form 42% of all the foreign born black population in the United States, and most African immigrants in the US are from West or East Africa. There's also a 52% population growth between 2010 and 2018. And the top five countries where most African immigrants are from is Nigeria, Ghana, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. And the top five destinations where they settle in the US is Texas, New York, Maryland, California, Minnesota, and Ohio. So much remains unknown about the HIV epidemiologic profile and just the overall contribution of African immigrants to the domestic uh, US HIV epidemic. African immigrants are reported to have an HIV transmission rate six times higher than the general US population. And uh, we got to know this uh, through data from eight metropolitan areas. So in California, Georgia, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New York, um, New Jersey, Washington DC, and Washington in Seattle. And it reviewed a crude diagnosis rate of 120.6 per 100,000 persons per year versus 12.6 uh, per 100,000 per year in the general US population. And yet this picture is still very much incomplete. So to address this lack of data, we have states, cities, and counties that have very large African immigrant populations, such as Maryland, New York City, and King County, Washington, beginning to capture birthplace as part of their HIV surveillance efforts. In 2017, 9.5% of the totally new reported HIV diagnosis in Maryland was among African immigrants. 
And similarly, in New York City, 15% of all newly reported cases in 2018 was among um, African immigrants. And in 2018, the crude rate for new HIV diagnosis among African immigrants in New York City was 59.9 per 100,000 people compared to 22.5 among Caribbeans and 7.0 per 100,000 among Asian um, immigrants. So between 2014 and 2018, among all the foreign born populations in New York City, African immigrants accounted for the highest new HIV diagnosis. So this actually suggests that African immigrants are at an increased risk of HIV infection and they warrant a closer examination. And so contrary to suggestions by some scholars that African immigrants were already infected in their home countries and are already are only just testing in the US, newer data debunks this. Studies reveal an ongoing transmission among African immigrant communities in the US. Further, there are substantial differences in the epidemiology of HIV acquisition among African immigrants compared to the US uh, HIV profile. So HIV transmission among African immigrants is predominantly heterosexual, through heterosexual contact. And so 92% of um, new infections among African immigrants was through heterosexual contact compared to 24% in the US population. And in the general US population, um, the 69% of new infections was attributable to male to male sexual contact. And so as HIV transmission continues to occur and increase among African immigrants, it is imperative that we make HIV prevention strategies available to African immigrants. There have been a wide range of HIV prevention strategies since the beginning of the epidemic. And yet, um, limited programmatic efforts that are aimed at reducing HIV among African immigrants is mainly focused on interventions such as education and HIV in, in, um, testing. So current interventions in the US focus on the, US, the use of ARVs, that is antiretroviral um, drugs for prevention. So we have the antiretroviral therapy for prevention, which is U equals U, undetectable equals um, untransmittable. If someone is on uh, prep, if someone is on their medication, their HIV medication, and they take it, they are virally suppressed and they cannot um, transmit it. Then we have pre-exposure prophylaxis, which I'll be talking more about today. And we have post-exposure prophylaxis, which is the use of ARV drugs um, for someone who has been exposed to it. So immediately after someone is exposed. So there's just that increasing recognition that these traditional methods of prevention, such as safe um, sexual practices and free condom distributions, need to be supplemented by new biomedical strategies, such as the oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. So let's talk about PrEP. And uh, on the right, you can see a picture of Truvada, which is one of the brands of PrEP. So PrEP is the use of ARV drugs by HIV uninfected persons to prevent the acquisition of HIV before exposure. And I would like to clarify, so for most people, some people are used to HIV positive or HIV negative, but we are moving towards a status neutral language. And so we say HIV uninfected and people living with HIV instead of positive or negative. And so PrEP is for people who are uninfected. They have to take it before exposure. And uh, this was approved and introduced in 2012 by the US Food and Drug Administration for adults and in 2018 for adolescents weighing at least 77 pounds or 35 uh, kilograms who are at risk for HIV. So we know that daily PrEP uh, reduces the risk of getting HIV from sex by more than 99%. And it will take at least one week on PrEP uh, before you'll be protected for anal sex and then also three weeks for vaginal sex. And you, it's one pill a day. So it's just one pill taken once a day. You get tested for HIV and STIs every three months. Um, there's also the SCOVI that has been approved as PrEP, but the SCOVI is not approved for use in those at risk for vaginal sex. And efforts to scale up PrEP in the US focuses heavily on um, just the male to uh, male sexual uh, contact and or MSM population. And so despite this proving effectiveness, that 99% that I just mentioned, only 16% of the estimated 1.2 million potential users are taking the medication thus far with no information about utilization among African immigrants. So given that rapid population growth, the differences in the epidemiology of HIV acquisition, and also the reported high incidence of HIV among African immigrants, make it a priority population that must be understood for us to be able to achieve local and national HIV treatment and prevention goals. 
And so there's just no information about PrEP uptake among African immigrants. So we don't know the potential for PrEP as an HIV prevention strategy. We do not know about the awareness level and there's just no information on the factors that would actually influence uptake. And so to ensure that PrEP is accessible to those who may most need it within the African immigrant community, there's the need for us to explore the acceptability cultural appropriateness, and also the challenges that African immigrants may face in assessing PrEP for HIV prevention. Also, we do know that uh, African immigrants are always categorized broadly as one group, yet the African immigrant community is diverse, migrating for over 50 countries. The representation of Africans from different countries as a homogeneous group in the literature is a cause for concern. African immigrants have unique languages, cultural traditions, and also religious beliefs which can affect health decision making and in consequence, their risk of HIV infection. So the perception of a single African identity mask important nuances in behavior. In light of this, my study focuses on one African immigrant group, Ghanaian immigrants. So Ghanaian immigrants are a growing population in the US and they are the third largest um, African immigrant group in the United States. They typically reside in large urban areas such as DC, um, New York City, Columbus, Ohio, Virginia, Minnesota, Atlanta, Baltimore, and New Jersey. Coincidentally, these are also areas with known higher HIV prevalence. Um, we are focusing on one subgroup because the lack of adequate published evidence concerning health challenges based, uh, faced by the various subgroups among African immigrants, for example, Ghanaians, creates gaps in designing, framing, and implementing targeted interventions. So this research was guided by some framework and theories, and I'll briefly describe them. The first framework is the PrEP care continuum. Now, the PrEP care continuum is an HIV prevention framework that researchers and practitioners use to measure the implementation and progress of PrEP use, so uh, PrEP awareness, uh, uptake, adherence, and retention. And each step of this continuum represents important opportunities for engagement or disengagement with PrEP for prevention, and it's also a very important point for intervention. My research focuses on the first part of the continuum. So in study one, the focus was mainly on awareness and willingness to use, which is a bridge between awareness and uptake. And in study two, I focus on willingness to talk to a healthcare provider about PrEP and willingness to use PrEP. And all these actions, the willingness and awareness are still um, heavily within the first stage or, you know, bridges the first and the second stage awareness and uptake. Next is the social ecological model. And this is really a very broad approach to thinking about the health of people. So people do not act in isolation, which is why it's important to understand the ways in which they interact with their communities and environment. So the social ecological model takes into consideration the individual, the affiliations with people, organizations, their community, and then the policy and environment and how they interact to form behaviors. And each level overlaps with other levels. So this social ecological model was used in organizing the results of manuscript two on the barriers to prep uptake. Finally, we have the self-determination theory. Now the self-determination theory is a social psychological theory of human motivation. According to the self-determination theory, healthy uh, behavior changes optimized in social environments that support three basic human psychological needs, autonomy, that is having control over one's life, competence, having uh, the capability to succeed, and relatedness, feeling connected to others. And autonomy support is a concept that is examined in manuscript three. I conducted two studies from which I created three manuscripts. As you can see, manuscript one and two is from the first study, which was qualitative, and manuscript three is from study two, which was quantitative. And the aim of manuscript one was to qualitatively explore awareness, perceptions, and willingness to use PrEP. The aim of manuscript two was to qualitatively explore the potential challenges to PrEP uptake and how to overcome them. And for manuscript three, the aim was to examine psychosocial factors that may impact PrEP uptake using quantitative um, data. Since both manuscripts one and two are from one study, I would like to present uh, the overview of the methods for this study. And so to be part of this study, you had to be 18 years and above, uh, speak English and be born in Ghana, and also recruited using WhatsApp. And WhatsApp is a social media uh, platform very popular among African immigrants and Ghanaian immigrants as well. All interviews were conducted in March 2020 and I recruited from across the United States. 
a web-based link for an eligibility screening questionnaire was embedded in a WhatsApp uh, recruitment information. So I posted it on my status as well as in groups. And then once participants had clicked on the link and then filled in their demographic information, as well as provide their WhatsApp number for me to contact them, I would now send out an information sheet with a description of the study at least 24 hours prior to the day um, selected for the interview and then uh, had the interview on WhatsApp. So I uh, use a semi-structured interview guide and uh, actually assess awareness of PrEP, the perception of PrEP as a medication for prevention, as well as those who use PrEP for HIV prevention, the willingness to use PrEP, and then the potential barriers and facilitators to PrEP uptake. So I coded uh, this, my transcripts, I uh, analyzed it using in vivo 12 uh, plus software, and then I analyzed data using template analysis. Now template analysis is a type of thematic analysis which begins with uh, the development of a coding template, which summarizes themes identified by the researchers as important in a data set. And to be included as a theme, a concept should have been discussed by two or more participants. Um, there were two independent coders, and then the kappa between these two independent coders were 0 0.94, indicating a very strong agreement between the two coders. So these are the sample characteristics of participants for both manuscripts one and two. Though I had 40 participants take part in this interview, only 35 were comfortable providing me with demographic information. So um, this sample was 57% male with 43% female. The age range was between 18 to 37 years and the mean age was 32.8 years. This was a very highly educated sample. 71% had a four year college education and above. 85% had health insurance, and we recruited uh, from 12 states, with um, New York and Ohio being uh, the states that had uh, the most people. Next, I'll present the results from Manuscript 1, and it explores the awareness of PrEP and the willingness to use PrEP. This study um, was published in AIDS Patient Care and STDs in late 2021. So if you'd like to take a closer look at any of the results, this is where you can find them. But a quick summary of the themes. There was low awareness of PrEP and participants were confusing uh, PrEP with PEP, which is post-exposure prophylaxis. There was a positive perception of PrEP as medication for HIV prevention. There were divergent views on PrEP candidates, that is uh, PrEP users, and also the, there were very mixed reasons or views for the willingness to use PrEP. So here are some illustrative quotes from participants. Um, there was low awareness, so participants shared that I've not been aware of this medicine. I don't even know there's medicine you could take that could prevent you from getting HIV. And the uh, confusion of PrEP with PEP, participants shared with us that, you know, the little I know about it is that if a person feels they've been exposed, then they are recommended to take PrEP while they wait for their results, it might help them. And so they were really describing uh, PEP, which is post-exposure. Uh, participants view PrEP as very beneficial, but there were some concerns of risk compensation. So they mentioned that PrEP is a good thing. Uh, we don't have a vaccine, we don't have a cure. So anything that will make people much safer from getting the virus is a good thing. But then uh, another uh, participant shared that, you know, they feel like if PrEP is there, then people will not use the ABCs. Now the ABCs are the primary form of HIV prevention messaging that is pushed in Ghana, abstinence, uh, being faithful, and C is condom use. And so uh, thus participants, most participants felt that uh, if people, if there's PrEP, people won't abstain, people won't be faithful, people won't use condoms. And so people will go ahead and have sex anyhow, thinking since we have the drugs, they can just do things anyhow. Um, people viewed PrEP positively individually, so they mentioned that they will respect people who use PrEP, um, they will see it as they are taking care of themselves and making sure they are not getting um, infected, so that is very responsible. Yet overwhelmingly, participants explained that members of the Ghanaian community will perceive anyone who is taking PrEP as promiscuous, with women being judged more harshly. And so um, this person mentioned that I thought I would have thought the person is a whore, excuse my language, or sexually unstable, and the person sleeps around, therefore they need their medication. Because I feel like if you don't have the intention of sleeping around, why would you decide to take such a medication? Now, there were varied reasons why people were willing to use PrEP. But partner HIV status and desire for multiple sexual partners dominated as reasons participants considered influential in their willingness to use PrEP. So most women indicated that they will only be willing to use PrEP if their romantic partners were infected, while male partners, in contrast, noted that they will use PrEP if they wanted to have unprotected sex 
with multiple partners. And so from the court, you can see that this participant says, my boyfriend and I are pretty serious, but if in the event he tells me, babe, this is what I have, you know I love him to death, and if that's what I have to do, then I'll definitely take prep because I want to be with him. In contrast, a male partner shared, if I had one more than one sexual partner and I don't know their status, I'll use prep. There were very divergent views on other Ghanaians' willingness to use PrEP, and they gave uh, varied reasons. And so here, those participants shares that in context, to give like in terms of context, a lot of people don't use condoms because they feel it's uncomfortable. It reduces the level of pleasure you get from a sexual activity. So if there's medication that will prevent you from actually getting the HIV and AIDS, they will see it as an alternative to ha actually having protected sex. So summary of manuscript one findings, uh, we found out that there was just low awareness of oral HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, but participants were open to PrEP. We do know that uh, they see PrEP as a necessary tool for HIV prevention, but they were concerned about risk compensation. There's also the finding that gender and relationship power dynamics may actually affect PrEP acceptance, and that perceived stigmatization for PrEP use in interpersonal and community context may affect PrEP uptake among Ghanaian immigrants. Next is manuscript two, that explores the barriers to PrEP uptake and how to overcome them. This has been accepted for publication in AIDS education and prevention. So for manuscript two, there's a lot to unpack here. At the individual level, there was low HIV knowledge and risk perception. Participants shared that there were inadequate knowledge about HIV transmission and prevention. This could serve as uh, a barrier to PrEP uptake. For prevention options, male participants preferred condom, and it was just the convenience of using condom over that everyday use of PrEP, so that one pill a day. There was also misconceptions about PrEP use. Men thought that the psychological burden of having to take a pill every day could decrease the pleasure of sex, and it might lead them to underperform in bed. Others also thought that taking PrEP could make them impotent or could reduce their urge for sex. There were concerns about side effects. Uh, most participants expressed that the potential side effects, you know, they believe that it will function differently in people of African ancestry. Others were worried that there could be hidden side effects of PrEP that have not been indicated on uh, the medication bottle. A noteworthy revelation by female participants was the idea that the side effects of PrEP, such as diarrhea, um, vomiting, headaches, could lead to suspicion of pregnancy a situation they would rather avoid. So they would not use PrEP in order not to be put in a very uncomfortable situation with their parents. At the individual level, there was just a fear of stigma, um, shame, that social exclusion, and unintentional HIV uh, disclosure. So all participants unanimously agreed that that perceived stigma related to HIV, which could lead to isolation and exclusion, would be a huge barrier. HIV is still believed to be a death sentence. And so any medication that is linked to HIV, whether it is for prevention or not, will lead to being perceived as HIV infected by members of the community. And so it will prevent them from taking PrEP. At the community level, there were just cultural beliefs and health related superstitions. So there were superstitions related to health that taking medication for a disease you didn't have meant you are inviting that disease into your life. Participants also noted that Ghanaian cultural values and norms prevent the discussion of sex and sexual health issues. So the lack of conversation around these issues may make people really uncomfortable discussing sex and HIV prevention topics because it is seen as an admission that you are being sexually active. Other participants shared that Ghanaian culture is not accepting of members of the LGBTQ plus community. And so taking PrEP may lead them to be associated with members of the LGBTQ plus community. And so um, with, within the Ghanaian community, members of um, LGBTQ plus community are really ostracized and shamed. So they did not want to be linked to this community. There was also the concept of usefulness of preventative care. So participants questioned why they should take medication to prevent a disease they are yet to get and may never get. So they compared the idea of taking PrEP to prevent HIV to taking aspirin or paracetamol to prevent a headache they do not yet have. Participants did not recognize the usefulness of the concept of prevention for a disease like HIV, and they felt that taking medication for such a really long time feels like punishment. Religion was a very influential factor in the health decision making for many participants. Participants explained that they would not be infected with HIV through God's protection and believed in divine healing. They believed that through God's grace, they may not be infected or will be healed if they are infected, so they do not see the need to take medication to prevent HIV. Also, taking uh, such medication like PrEP may also indicate a lack of faith. 
At the organizational and structural level, there were financial barriers, so costs. Participants perceived that PrEP would be very expensive and they were concerned if their insurance would cover it. Others also state that um, the community members' undocumented status, which may impact their access to health insurance, will affect their ability to um, abduct PrEP. There was also issues with access where participants um, mentioned the lack of awareness of where to even find PrEP and then just that prescription nature of it, that they prefer that PrEP is over the counter and they pick PrEP up at the pharmacy rather than going into the hospital. At the effectiveness and efficacy, participants didn't have trust in the science of PrEP. So they just had a general uncertainty about the safety of the medication and the correctness of that research. That's, you know, the effectiveness level of 99% as is being mentioned. They felt that years down the line, um, it could change. That number could change from being 99%, it could go down, especially if the research was done incorrectly. And participants shared us with us some ways in which they believe uh, will help overcome these aforementioned barriers. First, um, they mentioned that uh, having comprehensive and culturally competent HIV prep and sexual health education will help us overcome the barriers, as well as having their providers, their healthcare providers, give a recommendation to use prep. So here are some illustrative quotes. So this participant shares with us that in our Ghanaian communities, in teaching someone about prep, First, you have to educate them about the fact that HIV is not a death sentence and HIV is not AIDS, they are two different things. And then next it says, uh, the word sex is not common to hear someone say sex, you understand? So we need more sex education. And this participant says that if we tell people what about PrEP, what it is for the users, the importance of taking PrEP and how it protects people to that end, they are likely to take it. And uh, finally, also recommendation from PrEP, where this participant shared that if their physician tell them there's a new drug, it's prophylactic and everything about PrEP, then they are more likely to take it because they trust their personal physicians. So summary of manuscript two findings, we realize that there are misconceptions about PrEP that is tied to construction of masculinities. There's also low HIV knowledge and risk perception. There's also that perceived stigmatization that have very strong cultural underpinnings. There's the usefulness of preventative care in uh, HIV prevention, and then the role of faith and religion in HIV prevention, as well as a trust in healthcare providers. So based on study one, these psychosocial factors were highlighted to potentially affect PrEP adoption. And study one is manuscript one and manuscript two that I just presented. So first is low HIV risk perception. Now studies reveal that believing oneself to be or feeling at risk can motivate PrEP use. But findings from study one suggest that many Ghanaian immigrants do not perceive themselves to be at risk of HIV. And this could significantly affect their willingness to adopt PrEP. Next is high HIV stigma. So findings from study one revealed that the anticipated and perceived HIV stigma were likely to be barriers to PrEP uptake. The current FDA administration approved formulation for PrEP are antiretroviral medications that are used in the treatment of HIV infection. PrEP is for people who do not have an HIV infection. However, because this is known to be the same medication taken by people living with HIV, PrEP is stigmatized by association. Next is the belief in traditional gender norms. Participants in study one express beliefs that are consistent with their belief in traditional gender norms. For example, compared with men, women were willing to use PrEP for prevention to stay with their partners living with HIV. This is consistent with a system of traditional belief which characterizes femininity as the desire to please husband, submission, uh, passivity and also self-silencing. And self-silencing is a relational coping strategy in which women minimize their self-needs and focus on meeting the needs of others in order to preserve their relationships. Research also indicates that when women report more traditional gender roles, if they held like stronger beliefs in these traditional gender roles, they were less likely to advocate for HIV prevention behavior, such as negotiating for condom use, engaging in uh, HIV or self-care behavior, and also seeking healthcare. And so these beliefs may increase vulnerability to HIV and limit the ability to engage in HIV preventive behaviors. Men in study one were also willing to use PrEP, but for protection against um, 
engaging in multiple sexual partnerships. So for male participants, they also associated PrEP with lower sexual functioning and pleasure. And so these findings suggest an endorsement of traditional gender norms in which masculinity is characterized by dominance, sexual conquest, and multiple sexual partnerships. Among Ghanaians, sexual performance and strong libido may be especially integral to masculine identities. And so construction of masculinities based on traditional gender roles may discourage men from seeking healthcare services, including HIV prevention services. Finally, there's healthcare provider autonomy support. So findings from study one indicate that the core factors that may influence PrEP acceptability among Ghanaian immigrants may be their experiences or non-experiences of autonomy support by their healthcare providers in the form of a recommendation to use PrEP. Autonomy support is the perception of choice. And then the components of a healthcare system that allows individuals to feel comfortable disclosing their social and medical histories and enable them to take control of their health decisions are referred to as autonomy support. So SAS manuscript three from study two explores psychosocial factors associated with PrEP uptake outcomes among Ghanaian immigrants in the US. Before I start presenting the results, I want to break back the PrEP care continuum so we are all oriented with that again. Um, my research focuses on the first part of the continuum, and in study two, which is manuscript three, I am focusing on the willingness to talk to a healthcare provider about PrEP and willingness to use. Now, willingness to talk to a healthcare provider about PrEP is not just talking to a healthcare provider about I want to use PrEP. It involves talking about your sexual history as well as your sexual behavior. And all these actions, um, willingness to use, willingness to uh, talk to a healthcare provider is really within the first stage of bridges, the first stage of awareness and uptake. So we consider two research questions related to two outcomes, willingness to talk to a healthcare provider and willingness to use. The first research question, I wanted to know if healthcare health, uh, provider autonomy support, HIV stigma, HIV risk perception, and a belief in traditional gender norms will be associated with the willingness to talk to a healthcare provider. And I hypothesize that the higher perceived healthcare provider autonomy support and also higher HIV risk perception will be significantly and positively associated with the willingness to talk to a healthcare provider about PrEP. And also a higher HIV stigma and stronger beliefs in traditional gender norms will be significantly and negatively associated with the willingness to talk to a healthcare provider. And this is a pictorial depiction of this hypothesized association. Um, in here too, I further hypothesize that healthcare provider autonomy support will be influenced by HIV stigma, HIV risk perception, and a belief in traditional gender norms. For research question two, I wanted to know if HIV stigma, HIV risk perception, and belief in traditional gender norms will be associated with the willingness to use PrEP. And I hypothesize that HIV risk perception will be significantly and positively associated with the willingness to use PrEP, as well as a higher HIV stigma and a stronger belief in traditional gender norms will be significantly and negatively associated with the willingness to use PrEP. And so this is um, a pictorial depiction of that hypothesized association between stigma, um, risk perception, belief in traditional gender norms, and the willingness to use PrEP. So we conducted a cross-sectional online survey of a non-probability sample of Ghanaian immigrants across the US uh, between June and July 2021. And the inclusion criteria, you had to be 18 and older. You have to identify as Ghanaian, be able to read and understand English and also be able to use WhatsApp because we are recruiting participants um, using WhatsApp. I uh, used RedCap for the data collection and management and participants uh, were offered a compensation of $10 Amazon e-gift card. We use a psychometrically sound uh, scales to measure our variables. So we use the healthcare climate questionnaire, a 15 item instrument to assess the perception of healthcare provider uh, autonomy support. We assessed gender roles and norms perception using the gender inequitable men scale. And this is a 27 uh, measure of attitudes towards gender norms and roles in the domains of sexual and reproductive health, parenting and sexuality. We also use the brief HIV AIDS stigma and discrimination in developing country scale to assess HIV stigma. And this scale measures three HIV AIDS related stigma factors, shame, blame and social isolation. Now for the HIV stigma, I would like to draw your attention to the scale values and the sample questions that are being asked. I will circle back to this in the results. And so for this particular scale, strongly agree is one, 
um, the possible score range is 23 to 92. And the sample item is people living with HIV should be ashamed. It has similar questions, you know, people living with HIV are cursed among others. We assessed HIV risk perception using a four item perceived risk for HIV infection scale. And we also used a seven item scale to assess willingness to use PrEP and to talk to a healthcare provider about PrEP. So all the analysis were conducted using SAS software. Um, descriptive statistics were used to summarize the social demographic characteristics. Um, to address the research questions, we performed the multivariable generalized linear regression models. Um, we had the crude associations and then we adjusted for potential confounders for both models, for both research questions. We then conducted a backward step right regression technique to adjust for the potential confounders where all the independent variables were added to the model. There were also, I did also um, I did some exploratory interactions. So we tested for possible interactions between the predictors by fitting the models with interaction terms. And then we tested for interaction among the different predictors. The significance level for the final models was set as a p-value of less than 0.05. And the dependent variables, again, was willingness to talk to healthcare provider and willingness to use PrEP. So a total of 764 Ghanaian immigrants enrolled in the study. Participants age range from 21 to 55 years with an average age of 28 years. The sample are primarily identified as male, um, heterosexual, married, college educated, employed, and had an income of 75,000 and above. The majority of the participants had health insurance and a primary care provider. So in this table, I present a summary of the psychosocial variables. Um, the, the score range is provided to help with understanding the mean numbers. So with gender norms, having a higher total score indicates attitudes that are more supportive of gender equity. So having higher scores means that they had weaker beliefs in traditional gender norms. For autonomy support, high scores indicate a more autonomy support healthcare climate. And for HIV stigma, Lower scores indicate increased levels of HIV stigma. The lowest possible score for this girl is 23. This is a bit disheartening to see, but it also indicates that um, there's much that needs to be done in addressing stigma among Ghanaian immigrants. For risk perception, we had higher scores that indicate a higher risk perception. And in here, they had a lower risk perception. So overall, Ghanaians held gender equitable attitudes and norms. That is a weaker belief in traditional gender norms. They experienced a high autonomy support from their healthcare providers and held high stigmatizing attitudes. Participants in this sample reported low levels of HIV risk perception. So next, I'll present the results related to my outcome, willingness to talk to a healthcare provider about PrEP. So in this table, I present only the significant results of the association between participants' social demographic information and their willingness to talk to a healthcare provider. Participants identified as, who identified as homosexual or other had a decreased willingness to talk to their healthcare providers about PrEP compared to those who identified as straight or heterosexual. And those with an annual income of 75,000 or more had a significantly increased willingness to talk to their healthcare providers about PrEP. In this table, I present the results of the association between the psychosocial factors and the willingness to talk to a healthcare provider about PrEP. So willingness to uh, talk to a healthcare provider about PrEP was associated with healthcare provider autonomy support, HIV stigma, risk perception, and also belief in traditional gender norms. Then there were some interactions. So there was an interaction between gender norms and HIV stigma, and this interaction decreased the willingness to talk to a healthcare provider about PrEP. So next, I will present the results related to my outcome, willingness to use PrEP. So in this table, I present only the significant results of the association between participant social demographic characteristics and their willingness to use PrEP. So here, those who identified their gender as other had a significantly decreased willingness to use PrEP compared to their counterparts who identified as females. And then also identifying as a homosexual was associated with a significantly decreased willingness to use PrEP compared to identifying as a heterosexual. In this table, I present the results of the association between the psychosocial factors and willingness to use PrEP and no 
none of the psychosocial factors were associated, but there was an interaction. So gender norms being related to HIV stigma decreased the willingness to use PrEP. False gender norms related to HIV risk perception increases the willingness to use PrEP. So summary of manuscript two findings, uh, manuscript three findings, sorry. All the psychosocial factors uh, were associated with the willingness to talk to a healthcare provider. But um, contrary to hypothesis, there were no psychosocial factors associated with the willingness to use PrEP. But we observed a paradoxical finding where though most participants in this sample had an overall low willing, um, HIV risk perception, they were willing to talk to a healthcare provider about PrEP. And one explanation for this could be that um, because of those populations low awareness of PrEP, it may have led to an increased curiosity about um, the, like an increased curiosity to speak with their healthcare provider to know more about PrEP. Another explanation could be that since Ghanaians in this sample reported high autonomy supportive behaviors, they might be comfortable discussing their sexual history and behaviors with their providers and thus may discuss uh, the potential for PrEP. And so this really provides support for the role of autonomy supportive healthcare in the uptake of HIV prevention strategies such as PrEP. There were also interactions between gender norms, HIV stigma and risk perception. And so there's the need for us to begin to consider the role of sociocultural influences related to gender norms that could influence PrEP related outcomes in Ghanaian immigrants. And conversations related to HIV stigma and PrEP uptake among Ghanaian immigrants are likely to be much more effective if the discussion is broadened to include intersecting identities and the resulting stigmas. As our findings indicated, um, gender identity as such as other or um, sexual orientation of gay or other were negatively associated with any of the outcomes. And so this could partly result from the stigma that is attached to such orientations in Ghana as well. Now, the overarching goal of this research was to explore the acceptability and potential uptake of PrEP among Ghanaian immigrants. Now, I'd like to bring these two studies, which yielded these three manuscripts together and talk about the bigger picture. There may be the potential for PrEP acceptability among Ghanaian immigrants. Ghanaian immigrants, even though they had little to no information about PrEP, had an, a positive disposition to it. So prior research highlights the role of a positive disposition or an openness towards PrEP as the first step in assessing PrEP. There's also the key role of sociocultural context. So cultural beliefs, gender norms, religion, and also supportive healthcare system to the acceptability and adoption of PrEP among Ghanaian immigrants. Gender specific stigma and gender relational dynamics have been shown to impact uh, engagement in HIV prevention services among African women. There's also the need for uh, fresh perspectives towards understanding the factors that drive engagement with HIV prevention strategies. So perspectives such as focusing on intersectional stigma and then also looking at gender equity programming as well. So while the findings of this research have contributed to the literature on HIV prevention, they also have very important oh, implications for public life. health policy research and practice file online. and TurboTax is going to give you any a systematic how best to navigate your taxes for this year. There are any systematic effort to affect change in the population's overall health experience often begins with public policy. The US health system usually recognizes the diverse nature of populations, but public health policies that focus on health outcomes in the US are often discussed in reference to five broad racial ethnic categories that were outlined by the Office of Management and Budget. And so the lack of disaggregation of data leads to the continued lack of visibility and representation in our understanding of different identities and life experiences. This also limits public health officials' ability to allocate and target resources to communities that are disproportionately burdened by HIV. The findings of this study also provide some preliminary information about the role of gender-specific stigma and stigma across intersecting identities. The focus on stigma is mostly generalized HIV stigma. And so future research may want to examine the influence of these generalized HIV stigma intersectional stigma, social cohesiveness, and PrEP uptake among Ghanaian immigrants. The current research also highlights the impact of culturally sanctioned gender norms and roles in PrEP uptake. There are a limited number of studies that explore gender equity and gender equitable norms and their influence on biobehavioral strategies such as PrEP. 
PrEP holds a lot of promise for women as it is not a milled control option like condoms. The development of new delivery modalities similar to contraceptive options, such as vaginal rings and the injectable PrEP provides some form of empowerment for women's HIV prevention option. Finally, with intervention strategy, the effects of the rollout of PrEP among Ghanaian immigrants might include multi-level inter interventions with very strong collaborations between the community, faith-based organizations, and the healthcare system. So the processes needed for PrEP adoption as outlined in the PrEP care continuum are deeply embedded within the health system. Uh, but most interventions that focus on African immigrants are mostly at a community level. And while there are several faith-based uh, interventions developed to reduce the incidence of HIV and stigma among Black African Americans in the US, there's none in existence or adapted for Ghanaian or African immigrants. And yet prior research indicates that faith-based leaders are quite influential within the African immigrant community, including the Ghanaian community. And so really we need collaborations between these three groups, community faith-based healthcare to help facilitate adoption among Ghanaian immigrants. And so as the number of Ghanaian immigrants and invariably African immigrants continue to grow, it is crucial for healthcare providers, public health practitioners and professionals, as well as researchers to have accurate and timely information to guide their decision making towards this population. So what's next? Um, I would conduct some additional um, analysis because this is such a huge data set and, and may begin to you know, look at variations by gender on the PrEP outcome, as well as the preference for other delivery modalities such as on-demand PrEP, vaginal uh, rings, uh, the injectable PrEP. I also want to look at the awareness and the knowledge level, PrEP stigma, and maybe some moderation and mediation analysis. For other African groups, there's an ongoing data collection with Dr. Agbemenu on PrEP awareness and uptake, and then uh, begin to conduct some initial analysis on awareness and knowledge, as well as the different delivery modalities. Now, I would like to take the time for some acknowledgements. I have had a lot of people support me on this journey. I would like to thank my dissertation committee for their unwavering support and commitment. Lorraine, I wouldn't even know where to start. We played catch up in this last year and a half, and yet you have offered and given me so much direction and guidance, it feels surreal too. Thank you for officially being my mentor for this, this short period. In the time I've known and been mentored by you, I have seen myself evolve in my professional and personal life. If everyone in academia could be as kind, direct, and honest, academia would truly be a better place. Throughout my time of knowing you, you have been a tireless mentor and advocate helping me navigate academia as a woman who is African and Black. Thank you for helping me balance both academia and life's big events, death, wedding, surgery, health challenges, and immigration challenges. I couldn't have done it without your honesty and wisdom and belief in my abilities. And congratulations on being named a SUNY Distinguished Professor, a very well-deserved honor. Dr. Agbemenu, I want to thank you sincerely for the opportunities for these past four years, for the mentorship, the encouragement, the kindness and support. My four years in UB cannot be complete without my mentioning you. Thank you for the trust you posed in me, even in times when it was difficult to bring myself to trust in my abilities. When things were so difficult and challenging, you stood by me, sharing personal stories to help me overcome, to persevere, and here we are today. Thank you for teaching me a great deal about scientific research and providing me with multiple opportunities through manuscript development and conference presentation, as well as grant writing to further develop my research direction. Thank you for your unwavering support. Dr. Moss, I remember looking you up online when I first started my program because of my interest in global health. I read all the wonderful things that you had done and are still doing and thought, yes, he's definitely not going to find time to mentor a first year PhD student who still had no idea what her research path would be. I was so, so wrong. And I'm glad I didn't dissuade myself from sending that email where I requested your mentorship. For then I would have missed out on the expertise, the kindness, the humor, and just how wonderful you are as a person and a mentor. Thank you for giving me the platform to grow as an HIV prevention scientist, for always reminding me to focus on the big picture, the career beyond the PhD. Lauren, I am grateful to you for exemplifying and embodying true mentorship. The first time I joined your lab meeting, I shed tears after the meeting. It was surreal to see such a nurturing, collaborative and people-centered research environment. I sincerely thank you for being a tireless mentor and advocate. You always made time to meet with me regardless of the time zones and make sure I was making progress. I am fortunate to have worked and to continue working with you. Thank you for having faith in me to succeed. 
Heather, thank you so much for challenging me as a student on contributing to my transformation into a researcher. I am grateful for your dedication, knowledge, and perspectives. I stand on the shoulders of giants, and I'm extremely fortunate to be able to work with every one of you on my committee. I am also grateful for the departments and programs that have supported my training and professional identity during this journey. The IMSD and the CLIMB program supported the first two years of my training and provided me with leadership and scientific capacity to be able to complete this program. The Schomburg Fellowship for the extra support each semester that gave me breathing room when it came to my finances, allowing me to focus on my study. Thanks to the CHHB Dissertation Fund and the McDiamond Research Fund for providing me funds for the quantitative study. I am grateful. To the sister program and Shana Camp Owens, I am thankful for your support and encouragement throughout my program. To my UB community, I can't thank you enough. Thank you, Dr. Chris Atwood, for your time and expertise with my start analysis. Joanna and Anyango, thank you for advocacy and support my first two years in the program. I appreciate the feedback on my writing and helping me to improve my writing and presentation skills. Elizabeth Colucci, I appreciate all the opportunities and resources. Dr. Emmanuel Fempombuama, for your encouragement throughout this program. Mona, Thank you so much for the introduction to PrEP Research and to the ever wonderful and amazing Bab. Thank you for your care, kindness, and support during my journey. I would like to say a special thank you to my UB support system. Thank you for the friendship, the encouragement, and strength through this doctoral program. Spending time with all of you helped me maintain my upbeat attitude and smile throughout the challenging period. I look forward to continuing our friendship. As the African for Web goes, it takes a village, and it did take a village. Thank you, Dr. Kingori, for the encouragement and celebrating every win of mine. From Ohio University till now, you continue to provide guidance and support. Thank you to the wonderful people of the Hi-Fi Lab, who spans three countries, USA, Canada, and, Gan and Ghana. Gamji, Wale, Diane, Dada, all of the team. I appreciate the support and motivation. Thank you, Dr. Kredok for the opportunity to write my first quantitative manuscript and also to go through the peer reviews process for journals. Dr. Antu Okra, Martina, for exemplifying perseverance and resilience, for always being my advocate and cheerleader. I am grateful. Ya yeah, Santwa, thank you. You are the embodiment of true friendship. Thank you for flying all the way from California to care for me while I was recovering from surgery and for the cute baby pictures to keep me going. Dr. Osai Kwapon, my 3 a.m. friend, Thank you so much for the numerous hour long conversations and feedback as I shared with you my research ideas, for always encouraging me to stick to it, it will get better. Dr. Jimai Manunu, for your motivation and advocacy for women in higher ed, always reminding me of the greater impact and good. Dr. Kwame Otu, when the Akan say, Uye Nipenuya, it means you are kind and supportive. Thank you for being Nipenuya and for always being ready to answer my questions about regarding African cultural tradition and history. To be in the midst of academia, the healthcare system and the US immigration system is not for the faint hearted. Thank you to the best immigration attorney that could ever be, Eke Abwaji of AK Pukulo, for your tireless effort, advocacy, and representation. Thank you, Dr. Dupo, for all the love and support you provided me throughout my doctoral program. I also greatly appreciate your efforts reviewing my dissertation for grammatical errors while constantly reminding me that you are only a building and construction expert. I truly appreciate you. KOA, from California to Buffalo, for the one word encouragement I always wake up to, Vim or Igobi. Thank you for keeping me going, Chale, Ibi finish. Nana Aredamwa, for always being there to help me every time I reached out. I would like to thank the Church of Pentecost, Buffalo District, and the First Love Church, Bay Area, for the love, the prayers, and for distributing my survey, as well as my pastors, Dr. Buama, Bishop Henry, LP Dockers, LP Gifty and family, Pastor Harry and family. Thank you so much. I would like to say thank you to my family for being there for me in, on this journey. And especially to my mother, whose wisdom and encourage, shape, encouragement shaped me into the persons I am today. Words cannot truly express the gratitude I have for you. Thank you for always encouraging me to be the best person I can be. Our conversations throughout my entire doctoral program always rejuvenated my spirits and reminded me to focus on my goal. Thank you to my sweet, patient, thoughtful, generous, and loving husband, Mr. Chebafo. As the Nigerians will say, who know like better than? Thank you for sharing your passionate words with me during times of accomplishment and disappointment. Man like Stepa, I know this past year has been very difficult. Thank you for soldiering on with me. 
Thank you to the families who always continue to support me in the United States. Benjamin Apia Dodo and family, the Tepe family, Louisa Nimako and family. Thank you for catering to my meals when I was recovering from surgery and after. Nana Ama Ezwabulok for getting me through a very difficult and painful period in my life. David Adriago and Maxola Kondi. Thank you so much for helping me restart all those tough start questions and the whys. Um, Petra, Ya, yeah, and Irina Bouquet, thank you so much. Always checking on me. Kafuya and Henry, I truly, truly appreciate you. Dennis Moot, you are the best friend a person could ever ask for. Eunice and Daniel Donko, thank you so much for opening your home up to me in Buffalo. And the Nyanko Kampa family, from support all the way to from Ohio to now. Theo Osei, thank you so much for always supporting me and my many, many, many loved ones. And Celestina, for always cheering me up with your beautiful, beautiful creative works. Thank you all for your time and your presence today. I look forward to your feedback. Thank you. Okay. Um... I want to thank you, Gloria. That was a masterful presentation. You covered a lot of territory, gave us a lot of very interesting information. Um, and I'm gonna open it up for questions. We don't have much time left, but if there is anyone who would like to ask Gloria a question, now is the time. Just unmute and she's available. Are there any questions? Good morning, Gloria. Good morning. This is Dr. Jonas Ipopo, uh, Associate Provost at Baruch College in New York. I just want to say big congratulations to you. I'm proud of the work that you've done. Truly proud of the journey over the last couple of years. And um, I have to run to a meeting, but I really just wanted to say, I'm really proud of you. And we'll keep sharing for you because I know this is just many more great things that you're going to do with your research and with your way. And yes, you can still call me at 3 a.m. anytime. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, the chat is full of all sorts of comments. Uh, Jennifer, is there a way to maintain that? Okay, great. Yeah, I can save it for Gloria yes. Elson. Would you please? I can um, do that. Are there any other questions or comments? So I have a question and it has to do with your findings around stigma, um, which as you mentioned were um, disappointing. Um, what, if, if you were able to intervene in some fashion, what would be the first couple of things that you might do to help with the issues around stigma and HIV um, among Ghanaian immigrants? Um, thanks. Um, so I think that one of the first things will be to have, we need to have honest conversations about HIV and sex. Just um, like uh, some of my participants shared, we shy away from the topic of sex. And so we need to be able to have these conversations about sex and be able to, you know, disconstruct it. Yes, people are having sex, you know, we do know that. And so if you're going to pretend it's not happening, then it's still going to continue to be shrouded in secrecy. Next is to be able to talk about HIV, you know, transmission and HIV prevention, and also just um, the options that we have right now. Yes, in the past, there were not a lot of, um, you know, uh, options for um, treatments. Now we do have options for treatment and people can live healthy, productive, full lives with HIV. And so being able to have these conversations would begin to, we also need um, our pastors in this conversation, like our leaders in this conversation, we need them. Because um, interestingly, the, the faith-based organizations sometimes act as a place of refuge for people, but also as a, as, as a place for um, further stigmatization for people as well because of the messaging. And so we really need to have everyone on board with these kind of things. And so really with my first steps, that would be where I would start from. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, hello, Gloria. Um, um, my name is Wela Benike. Yeah. Um, I am quite interested to know what motivated you into this field. 
and also um, what advice you give to a research student entering into this area? Okay. Um, so the motivations are many. I think that starting from the HIV topic itself, I'm very personal. I had a relative that passed away and the stigma, I think that that is where it starts from. I think that that is my interest in that has been nurtured over the years. I've had um, Dr. Kingori nurture me in that uh, place as well. And then coming into UB, uh, my mentor at the time, Sarah Mona, was conducting research on PrEP. And so I began to read more about PrEP and the data and the information. And the more I read, I said, okay, um, we say 43% of African Americans, but where are the African immigrants in this? And also that realization that myself, I'm an African immigrant, I'm a Ghanaian immigrant here. And usually information or anything pertaining to African immigrants, it's almost like we exist, but we don't exist in the American society. And anything that happens, it only happens within our immigrant society. We talk about it, but we never see it in the mainstream media. And so just the fact that, okay, we are there. So I began to look into it and say, okay, no, we need to begin to look at our groups very well and begin to work with, um, begin to think about HIV prevention, like are we at risk at all in, in America? Or, you know, once we enter America, we are no more at risk and that disappears. And so that is where and that interest uh, came from as well. With the students who wants to go into those area, to be honest, you have to be very passionate about the research that you're doing. You want to like your research. And I think that that is one of the things. If you are not really invested in the research, it gets much more challenging because the journey is challenging, it's difficult. It's not really about, oh, you know, I'm, I'm reading, I'm doing my work. But then there are times where you want to sit behind your research and feel good about it. Even if you have a very low mood, you want to sit behind it and say, oh, you know, I feel like this, this, is, this is going to make an impact. And so that is what I'll tell people, anybody who wants to go into this area, be passionate about it. And Sometimes it takes a very long time to have impact. So don't expect that, you know, immediately I do this, the whole world is going to change. You'll be pretty disappointed and you'll be crushed. So it's always best to temper your expectation, but please be passionate and love what you are doing. Okay. Um, on that note, I want to thank everyone. I'm sure the conversation could continue, but Gloria's committee will need to meet after this. And so thanks again for all who attended. This is one of the best attended brown bags that we've had in our department. And I attribute that to the topic and to Gloria's passion as she just described it and to the excellent research that she presented today. So thank you very much and we will say goodbye. <laughs>